Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Let's, uh, tonight we're going to talk about something kind of, uh, kind of neat, I think. It's something that's been rolling around in my spirit for a while, so that's always a good thing to teach on. So let's go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. While you're finding that, we'll go ahead and open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and receive from your word. And so, Father, we just open ourselves to receive tonight from the Holy Spirit. He is, in fact, the teacher of the church. And so, Father, we just believe for him to guide and direct and move as he sees fit. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 20. Now, this uh, last couple of chapters of John here... Uh, He's, John is sharing what happened right at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. Now, the great thing about what the Lord's doing right now, he is in heaven interceding for us even now. His ministry hasn't ended. <laughs> He's engaged in intercession for the body of Christ right now, right there at the throne of God, right at God's right hand. So praise the Lord. That's exciting. But we're talking here about his earthly ministry, and this was the close of his earthly ministry and was after he had been uh, crucified, he'd been taken to his grave, but then, praise the Lord, he was raised from the dead. And that is what makes Christianity different than anything else, any other belief system, is that the founder of our belief system is alive and well. <laughs> and he has been raised from the dead, so uh, that's different than Buddha, he's still dead, you know. Uh, Muhammad, still dead. <laughs> A whole of those guys, no, but Jesus is alive, praise the Lord. So, we're going to look at, uh, beginning in verse, um, where shall we start? Let's begin in verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Jesus appeared to them, came to them when, after his resurrection. And the other disciples therefore said unto him, We've seen the Lord. In other words, after he was raised from the dead. But Thomas said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand to his side, I will not believe. Now notice that. He made a firm, as Brother Copeland likes to say, quality decision not to believe. <laughs> well, that's the wrong way to go, Thomas. I'm sorry. You need to make a decision to believe. But he had made the quality decision. He's not going to believe. And he basically said, now yeah, I think it's Missouri. I'm not 100% sure of this, but I think it's Missouri that's called a show me state. Well, that kind of attitude of, you got to show me. I got to see it. That's part of what we want to talk about here tonight. Most people make the statement, I've got to see it to believe it. And this is the phrase that's been turned around in my spirit. See it to believe it. There's a lot of folks who want to see it to believe it. And there's a lot of people in the world today that are of the, basically the belief, if you want to call it that, that if I don't see it, I won't believe it, which is pretty much Thomas's approach. Unless I put my hand into his side, unless I see the scars on his hands, I will not believe. And that, that decision that he's not going to believe is really where the world's at. I don't know about you, but I've been watching the world lately. They've made a quality decision not to believe. They are looking for every excuse, every reason to get God out of the world's affairs. <laughs> In other words, our people's affairs. So basically, we don't have anything to do with God, and we are choosing not to believe. And those few that are kind of on the edge, they're kind of the opinion, I'm not going to believe it unless I see it. You've got to show me something. Really, this is basically where the Jews were. You know, Jesus made the statement that Jews are always looking for signs. I mean, they were always after a show me moment. They were always saying, I want to see it before I believe it. But that's not what Jesus wanted us to do and what he, he wanted Thomas to do. So he said, I will not believe it. Then eight days again, the disciples were within and Thomas was with them this time. Now I like this. You know, Thomas sets himself up 
And then Jesus just comes in and, and makes it a teachable moment. You've heard the term teachable moment. Teachable moment is when people do dumb things and you can bring them aside and say, look, boy, <laughs> let, me, let me straighten you out here. <laughs> you remember what you just did? That was dumb. <laughs> so here's, here's Jesus. He's going to have that opportunity. Eight days later, the disciples were within, Thomas was with them, and came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Now the doors being shut is mentioned, John mentions it, because Jesus had to get there in the room, locked room. You know, like the old uh, uh, mystery movies and so forth. I've always talked about the locked room mystery. Well, this was a locked room mystery because the room was locked and yet Jesus appeared. So he obviously came through the wall, hallelujah, supernaturally, and he said, he stood in their midst, right in the middle of them, said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, here's his teachable moment, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. In other words, he's saying, I'm going to do just what you asked. I, you said you had to touch my hands. You said you had to put your hand into my side in order to believe. I want you to believe. But let's keep reading here. Reach hither thy finger, behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Now notice his attitude, Thomas's attitude of, I got to see it to believe it, was faithless. So if you find people in a situation that, let's say, you're talking about healing, they need to receive their healing, and there they are, and you start talking to them about healing, well, I'll believe it when I see it, they're faithless. You've identified them, okay? Now you can do something about it. Start teaching them the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. So therefore, you can start teaching them, get their faith level up. If you can get their faith level up, then they're no longer faithless. But he told Thomas, be not faithless, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord, my God. I think he was pretty shocked that Jesus appeared to him. Just like he said, just like he asked. But he said, be not faithless, but believing... Thomas's answer was, my Lord, my God. So at least he did recognize him as Lord. He believed God raised him from the dead because he's standing there. So, praise the Lord. Met all the qualifications for being born again. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, this is the see it and believe it, folks, thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus appreciates faith that doesn't want to see it first. That is faith as opposed to faithless. Okay, we're looking at two different approaches here. Thomas's approach is, i got to see it to believe it. Jesus called that faithless. But he said, blessed are those, highly favored are those, who believe without seeing. Now, I'll say this, I haven't met Jesus physically in the flesh. I didn't have the opportunity Thomas had here to reach hither my finger and put it in his wounds on his hand or his side. I've never seen him in the natural, all right? But I believe. Well, I say the, the same thing is probably true of all of us here. If you're a believer, you believe Jesus Christ raised from the dead, hallelujah, then you're a believer. You have believed. Well, according to this, you're blessed. Now, the word blessed here... It's not just, you know, people use religious terms and they throw them around and they don't think about them. Well, I'm blessed. What do you mean when you say you're blessed? It means you are highly favored. It means that you have received something that the world doesn't have, a blessing from God. Matter of fact, if you go back and study in Genesis when God blessed Adam and Eve, he gave them dominion. He said, be fruitful and multiply. That original blessing, Brother Copeland calls the, capital T, blessing, capital B. The blessing. The blessing is, you go forth, be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion. That initial blessing will carry you through, praise the Lord. Well, we're blessed. But we're blessed not just with that blessing that he gave to Adam. We're blessed with the blessing he gave to Abraham, who's the father of faith. We're blessed with the blessing of Jesus because Jesus said, if you believe without seeing, you're blessed. 
And many other signs truly did Jesus the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Now the life there he's talking about is the Zoe life of God, the eternal powerful life of God, God's own kind of life. So he's setting us up here for a life of blessing. He's setting us up here for a life different than the world. The world says, I need to see it before I believe it. We say, I believe it, having not seen it, and then I'll see it. So let's look at that in uh, motion. This is a very familiar scripture to us, not new to us at all. Uh, Mark 11, hallelujah, verse 22. Jesus answering, saith unto them, Have faith in God. Now there's some translations that word that a little differently. Some translations say, Have God's kind of faith. Or some even say, Here's how you use God's kind of faith. When he said, Have faith in God, he's not just saying, Well, have faith in God. He's out there. No. Here's how you use God's kind of faith. Let's see if that's not borne out by what he's saying here. Uh, verse 23. For verily or truly I say unto you that whosoever, well, I'm whosoever, shall say unto this mountain, so I've got to use my words, speak words of faith, say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith, so there's a second, saith, shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. There's three saiths. Three saiths to one believeth. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I like the fact that Brother Hagin pointed that out many years ago. You've got to say it in order to receive it. We believe it, and then we say it. But what are we doing? Let's, let's keep reading here. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that ye receive them. Now them, if you notice in the King James, is in italics. That means that the translators added it for understanding, for purposes of understanding. It's not in the original text. So let's take the word them out, and let's read it without that word. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive, and you shall have. Makes you think about it just a little differently. Believe that you receive, and you shall have. This is the opposite of Thomas's approach. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe it unless I see it. Jesus is saying, you will see it if you believe it. Okay? Different approach. And I like David Ingalls. David Ingalls has a song. You'll never get Abraham's blessings with a Thomas kind of faith. Well, the Thomas kind of faith is, I got to see it before I believe it. The Abraham kind of faith is, look, there's no way I can have a child. My wife's too old. I'm too old. But we're past childbearing years. In the natural, there's no way. And as a matter of fact, if you read the scripture very closely, it says that he considered his own body. He actually looked at his body and said, ain't no way, I'm not going to have a kid in the natural. But he made a quality decision, a choice to believe the Word of God. That's the difference. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to believe God on purpose. We've got to believe what God says in His Word above natural evidence. See, the people that say, I've got to see it to believe it, Jesus called that faithless. And he said, now think about it, faithless. There's no faith involved. If you have to see it in order to believe it, well, you know, this is this mouse. This mouse is made out of plastic, probably got a few electronic parts in it. But this mouse exists. It's real. I can touch it. It's a real thing. It doesn't take any faith for me to say this mouse exists. None at all. I can be completely faithless and believe that this mouse exists. Why? Because I can see it. I can touch it. That's the Thomas kind of faith. It's really not faith, it's faithless, but you see what I'm saying. But if I didn't see that mouse and yet believed it existed, that's different. That would require faith. Faith Ooh, hallelujah. Hadn't thought of it that way, Lord, but you're right. <laughs> Here's what he said. He said, faith 
won't work unless you don't see it. And I went, what? <laughs> but after I thought about it, I realized what he's saying. There's no faith involved if I see it, if I feel it. Faith operates when you don't see it. Amen? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So if I'm believing for my healing and I have symptoms in my body and I'm believing I'm healed, I'm believing in something that the natural world denies. The natural world says, you're sick. And I have to say, the, the world says I'm sick, my body may be saying I'm sick, but the Bible says that by Jesus stripes we were healed. If we were healed, then I am healed. If I am the healed, then I'm not sick. Now I don't say I am not sick as a confession, I'm just saying my identification is that I'm no longer the sick, I'm the healed. Okay? Think about that a minute. I don't go around saying I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick. That's not a good confession. That's just denying what's in your body. That's called Christian science. We deny what's real. That's not faith. And there was a time many years ago, many years ago, back in the 70s, when there were a whole lot of people convinced that faith was denying reality. I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick. That's faith. No, it's not. It's denying reality. I'm not denying the symptoms exist. I'm denying their right to exist in my body according to the Word of God. Oh yeah, they exist, but I don't dwell on that. I dwell on what I can't see, what the Bible says, which is that I'm the healed. By Jesus' stripes we were healed. If we were, then I am. If I am, then I'm the healed. Therefore, I enforce healing in my body by confessing I'm healed. Yeah, but you're not healed. Yeah, but the Bible says I'm healed. Yeah, but Dr. Bill, you're not healed. But the Bible says I'm healed. What am I doing? I'm taking the authority of God's Word above my circumstances. I may see the symptom, but I don't dwell on the symptom. I don't enforce the symptom. See, if I said, oh, I'm sick, I'm so sick, I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm enforcing it, right? But if I choose not to say that, it doesn't change the fact the symptom's there. It is. But I look at the Bible and say, let's go, well, let's, let's just look at a scripture talking about healing. Let's go over to uh, Psalm 103, an actual scripture in your own Bible. <laughs> Verse 1, a Psalm of David, bless the Lord, O my soul. My soul is my, my will, my emotions. So my will and emotions, you bless the Lord. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget, see, I would forget with my mind, will, and my emotions, right? My mind's what forgets. So I've got to remind myself, forget not his benefits. What's his benefits? Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Well, if he healeth all my diseases, and I have symptoms, he healeth all my diseases, but I have symptoms, what am I going to choose to believe? What am I going to choose to enforce in my life? Am I going to keep looking at the symptoms, then I'm faithless because I've got to see it to believe it. Lord, I'll be healed when I see the symptoms are gone. No, that's faithless. Faith says the Word of God says He heals all my diseases. The Word of God says He bore my sicknesses and carried my diseases, that by His stripes we were healed. Since it says that, I enforce that with my words. Now let's go back over to uh, Mark 11 again. Mark 11, verse 24. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire. Well, do I desire sickness or disease, or do I desire healing and health? <laughs> I desire the healing and health, amen? So what I desire is the healing. What I desire is a manifestation of healing in my body. Hallelujah. So... That's what I'm going to enforce. Therefore I say to you whatsoever things you desire when you pray, so there is a moment at which you pray. Believe that you receive and you shall have. Remember the them is not part of the original text. We're just reading it in the original text. Believe that you receive and you shall have. Now, really, the best way to read this is, at the moment you pray, believe that you have received it at that moment 
and ye shall have. What does that imply? You don't have it yet. Right? There's no manifestation yet in the physical realm. If there was, we could see it. But we're not dwelling on that. We're dwelling on the fact that if I believe at the moment that I pray that I have received, then I shall have. The shall have may take a little time. That may be an instant healing. I Praise the Lord. I'm all for that. But it may take some time as well. But you know what? It doesn't matter how long it takes. What matters is I believed, I received when I prayed. It, at that moment, as far as I'm concerned, what I enforce in my life is the healing, not the sickness. Okay, now remember what we said. I'm not denying that the sickness exists. I'm denying its right to exist in my body. Because I have desired it, I have prayed, and I have received by faith. Now let's go back up to verse 23, Mark 11. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say, there's our say, be thou removed, be thou cast, and see shall not doubt in his heart. So there's our believe. And shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. Believe that the things which he saith shall come to pass. In other words, it may not be instant. It may take a little time, but it shall. All right? I know I'm, I'm, I'm cutting through here and, and wordsmithing a bit, but I want you to see, see something out of it. Believe those things which he says shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Okay? Not whatsoever you thinketh about. Not whatsoever you dwelleth on. Whatsoever you say. See, this is where I'm convinced a lot of Christians aren't getting a hold of faith because they refuse to say. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll wish, they'll dream, they'll desire, but they don't ever get to the saying part. <laughs> There's a whole lot of Christians not saying. They're believing. Some of them are hoping and haven't got to the believing, but don't disparage hope. Matter of fact, I would planned to get to this scripture. We'll go ahead and jump over there. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. See, hope, a lot of spirit-filled, tongue-talking, word of faith, believing Christians look at hope as a negative. I don't hope, I believe. You won't believe unless you have hoped. Selah. <laughs> Think about that. You won't believe unless you have hoped. Because the word hope here is the Greek word elpis, E-L-P-I-S, elpis, and it means a constant favorable desire or expectation. Now if we take that phrase and plug it in here, faith is the substance of a constant favorable expectation or anticipation. So faith is, faith is, faith equals this giving of substance, and actually that's the way the Greek reads, giving of substance to the things that you had an expectation or hope as we would call it for. See, Bible hope isn't the kind of hope that a lot of people think about in the natural. They think, I hope so. That's not Bible hope. Bible hope is a constant favorable anticipation or expectation. It's an expectation. It's not a, oh, I hope so. It's a, I really expect. If Pastor Ed were to call me up and say, hey, meet me Saturday at 3 o'clock and we'll have a cup of coffee. I want to talk to you about some things. All week long, I have an expectation that he'll be there at 3 o'clock and we'll have some coffee and talk about some things. Why? Because I believe him. Pastor has shown himself to be you know, a trustworthy man who will enforce his word. So when he said, I'll meet you Saturday at the coffee shop, then he will meet me Saturday at the coffee shop. And I have every confidence on that. So what am I doing? Am I hoping like, oh, I hope he comes? No, that's not the kind of hope I have. I have an expectation. He's going to be there at 3 o'clock. 
I'll tell people all week, I meet one pastor at 3 o'clock on Saturday. I have an expectation. I have a, I'll make every preparation. I'll go to the coffee shop. I'll sit there and wait patiently until he comes. And he'll be there. Why? Because I have an expectation. That's Bible hope. Bible hope is a constant, favorable expectation or anticipation. Now look at that phrase. Constant, favorable expectation or anticipation. It's constant. It has to be constant. I have to know and have settled he's going to be there at 3 o'clock. Why? Because I believe pastor. Well, same thing with God and His Word. God's given us His Word. I have an expectation that He will manifest what He's told me in His Word. He will make it come to pass. He will, as this says, give substance to those things I've expected or anticipated. So faith is the giving of substance to the things we expect or anticipate. Now, I want you, I want you to kind of pull your religious thinking back here and, and think about this in a new way. Faith is a power source. It is a heavenly power source, just like electricity is a natural power source. We have electricity running in all these walls, in wires, and if we apply it correctly, it will do work for us, like turn lights on, or power computers, or do whatever. It's a power source. All right, faith is a heavenly power source. It has abilities. And one of the abilities that faith has is the ability to give substance to the things we hope or have anticipation or expectation for. Bible hope, based on the Word of God. I'm talk talking about people who just sit around and go, I want a car, I believe it for a car, and they don't have no scripture. They're not standing on anything. Well, I want a car. I I we're not talking about that. We're talking about taking the Word of God as a, as a carpenter would take a hammer like a tool and use it. Take the Word of God and use it like a tool. Have an expectation and anticipation based on the Word of God. And God will release His power, which is faith, to cause that thing to have substance. The mouse goes from not being here to being here, so to speak. In other words, substance would cause it to come to pass if it wasn't physically there. Now this mouse is physically there. I have to worry about that, but manifestation of healing might be something I do need to operate based on the Word of God to enforce in my life. So faith gives substance to the things we anticipate or expect. It is the evidence of things not seen. Not seen. Not the things that are seen, the things that are not seen. Which is why the Lord said a while ago, it's not faith if you see it. <laughs> Amen. See, Thomas wanted to see it before he believed it. We know now that in order to see it, we have to first believe it. In order to see it, we must first believe it. That's what he's saying here. Faith is giving of substance to the things we anticipate and expect, have confident, constant expectation for, and is evidence of the things we can't see. For by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, this power, this means of faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the Word of God. God said, light be, and a light was. God used His words and brought this entire creation into manifestation. So is it any wonder that we can take His Word that brought all this into the manifestation to start with and use it to affect the natural realm, to cause things to come to pass, even in this natural world? Now, going back over to, uh, to Mark 11, Let's go back and, and see it again. Have God's kind of faith, verse 22, verse 23, For verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He'll have whatsoever he saith. Therefore, because of that, I say unto you, Whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe you receive, and you shall have. That's the process. Now, Let's go back up to this verse where it says, shall not doubt in his heart. That used to bug me as a young, young, young Christian. 
when I was in high school, as a matter of fact, first time I read that scripture. And I said, whoo, I have what I say. I got real excited until I saw, and shall not doubt in his heart. And I said, oh, well, there you go. I'm going to doubt. I know that. Now, remember, I was just a kid sitting there in study hall with my Bible. And I read this, and I went, well, of course I'm going to doubt. I'm human. Well, now, hold on. Let's find out what this mean, this phrase means, doubt in his heart. The heart we know is the spirit of man. It's not the mind, it's the spirit. You are a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body. Your spirit's the real you. That's what's vital, that's what's alive. As a matter of fact, the, the Greek word, this translated spirit, which is pneuma, that word means the vital principle by which the body is animated. It's that which gives you life, it's the real you. You are a spirit. You have a suke, which is the Greek word, my will and emotions. You live in a soma, Greek word, which means the body. So this physical body is just, that's just a house you live in. Your mind, your will, and your emotions, what you think with, what you have emotions with, but it's the spirit that's the real you. So the heart is the spirit. Shall not doubt in his heart. The word doubt is the Greek word diakrino. And that Greek word means to differ. So let's read it that way. If you say, be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, and what you say doesn't differ from what's in your spirit in abundance. Now I realize I'm kind of embellishing there. <laughs> but actually that, that is literally what we're talking about. You, what is in your spirit man in abundance is what we're talking about. Because when you hear the word, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. The word gets into your spirit and starts building up in there. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Right? Out of the abundance. Abundance means more than just a little. <laughs> Alright? So the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. The abundance of what's in my spirit is what I'm going to speak. Matter of fact, it is what I'm going to speak, whether I want to speak it or not. If I've got doubt and unbelief stored down in my heart, I'm going to speak that out of my mouth. And when I get under pressure, that's what's going to come out. But if I've put the Word of God in my heart, in my spirit, and you get put me under a little pressure, that's what's going to come out. And when it comes out in abundance and doesn't differ, my words don't differ from what's in my heart, then I shall have whatsoever I say. In other words, the whole faith process operates based on whether it's in my heart in abundance. Well, that tells me something right there. My goal is to get it in there in abundance. Because if I can get the Word of God in my heart in abundance, then what comes out of my mouth is going to be in line with the Word of God. It, I'm going to enforce that scripture, that word, in my life, and it's going to come to pass. Because what's in my heart in abundance, if it doesn't differ, so that's what's talking about here with doubt. The word doubt, we think, oh, I'm going to doubt. No, if what you have in your heart doesn't differ from what you're saying out of your mouth, you are operating in faith. Now, remember our definition of faithless? i got to see it to believe it. The definition of faith is, I don't have to see it. I choose to believe it because of what the Word of God says. If I do that, then let's turn that saying around. That's a saying that's been around forever, <laughs> seems like. i got to see it to believe it. I see it in the scripture. I believe it and it comes to pass. That's really what we ought to put on a bumper sticker. <laughs> Not I got to see it to believe it, but I see it in the Word of God. I get the Word of God in my heart in abundance and it's whatever, and then I speak it and I enforce it in my life and it comes to pass. That's how faith works. So this phrase that like I said has been kind of floating around in my heart People got to see it to believe it. Got to see it to believe it. No, they don't. They don't have to see it in the natural to believe it. They have to see it in the scripture to believe it. See, that's what we're to believe, is the word of God. That's what we're to put our faith in, is the word of God. So I got to get that in my heart in abundance. So all I got to do is keep hearing the word. Now, Blen and I have a kind of a, a habit that we've developed, and that is I listen to uh, Word of Faith Radio healing station all night long. We got it played on a little radio, a little Wi-Fi radio that I got. I mentioned it last time I talked, I think. And I just play it, play it, play it, play it. And I'm hearing the Word, 
here in the Word. I find myself, sometimes I'll just wake up a little bit, kind of half, half awake. Do you know when you're kind of half awake, you've got your mind out of the way, it's going right in your spirit? And I hear Brother Hagin preaching the Word to me. And that Word's going into my heart. Hallelujah. It's building up in there in abundance. Well, now if you poke me, the Word's going to come out. <laughs> so, if I get under pressure, that's what's going to come out. It's the Word of God. Because that's what I'm putting in my heart in abundance. So that's, that's the, the secret to faith is what you put in because that's what's going to come out. You will say out of your mouth what you put in your heart in abundance. So if I'm constantly putting the Word in there, that's what's going to come out. Hallelujah. So we're not believing it if we see it. We see it in the Word of God. We put it in our heart. It comes out of our mouth and it comes to pass in our life. That's what I've been thinking about. See it to believe it? Well, I see it in the Word to believe it. I'm not going to believe it just because Brother so-and-so said it. I'm not going to believe it because that's the way they taught it at my church. I'm only going to believe it because of what I see in the Word. I've got to see it in the Word. Once I see it in the Word of God, once I've got the revelation of it, you know, I like Brother Hagin said one time, you're not going to get anywhere on somebody else's revelation. It's got to be real to you. You've got to get it in your spirit in order to operate on it. Praise the Lord. So, did you get anything out of this tonight? Hallelujah. Tried to ha keep it short and sweet. <laughs> Just that thought. Believe in it to see it. Well, we don't believe it to see it in the natural. We believe it and see it in the Word, and we confess it out of our mouth. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address PO Box 7752 Greensboro, North Carolina 27417 If you would like to contribute to our ministry please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button Thank you and may God richly bless you for your giving